Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I have Ayla, a very, very special guest. She is one of the top OnlyFans creators, and she really, I think, personifies the changing face of sex work. So I'm really excited to dive into this conversation with her. So Ayla, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So I want to actually just first off the bat kind of tell you something which is sort of funny. Um, So I obviously knew who you were. You've done like quite a few mainstream interviews. So your name's definitely been out there, especially with the explosion of OnlyFans during the pandemic. But um, I particularly uh, chased you up for an interview because my dad is a big fan of yours. (laughs) And he kept asking me when I was going to interview you. So Less that come off weird and creepy because I don't know how much you know about me, but my parents were uh, pornographers. So I grew up the parent. My mom was Susan Randall, kind of one of like the pioneers Mm -hmm. of women behind the camera. And my dad helped her run her business. Um, They've been together for like 50 years. And so I started working for them in the industry. They launched one of the first online um, websites back in like 1998 and we're actually really successful on the internet. They've since retired. My dad will be 80 in a week and a half, but you know, he still has like an interest in the adult industry and loves to hear about what's going on, you know, with my job and the changing face of the adult industry. So, um, he was really captivated by your story. I think he watched some of your interviews and, um, he also is a sucker for really beautiful pale woman with long legs as well. So dad, I know you're going to be watching this. Um, I see, I, I did what you asked. I have Ella here and she's lovely and dad, I love you anyways. So <laughs> this is kind of a great segue into the fact that you and I had drastically different upbringing. Um, and I know that you were raised, um, fundamentalist Christian, uh, so tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Um, I know you said you were quite sheltered and maybe how that informed how you feel about sex work and, and how you got into that. How'd you get there from being raised, being raised in such a religious background? Yeah. yeah first off, you're absolutely right. Our upbringings were very dramatically different. <laughs> like Maybe the, the closest to polar opposites you can get. So it's kind yeah. of cool to have like the like, you know, we're on the same sort of interaction here. Um, yeah, I was super fundamentalist, um, very religious, homeschooled, uh, isolated from the outside world. Uh, you know, the classic stuff. I don't know if, you know, people listening know any fundamentalist homeschoolers. They tend to keep to themselves. Um, I didn't know anybody who wasn't homeschooled. I didn't know anybody who had sex before marriage. Um, none of the people in my peer group had even kissed anyone. Uh, so this like concept was was very foreign to me, and and we weren't really allowed to watch media that had sexual interaction. Um, like if two, like if like a boy and a girl like held hands, uh, my parents would sort of poo poo it to be like, oh, like that's that's some secular stuff we don't get behind. Um, so it, it was quite strict. Wow. Uh, uh, so yeah, very <laughs> very isolated world. Um, I didn't really know what was going on out there for quite some time. Uh, very standard gender role expectations, red women and men, you know, the whole shebang. Um, but so when I got out, uh, it was, I, I think I had sort of an unusual relationship to it. Um, because once I lost my faith, like which everything had been based on, you know, my morals, my, uh, like understanding of how the world was made, not 6,000 years ago, what, like maybe evolution was true. Like maybe abortion is fine. I don't know. Like it hit every single thing, like including my life plan for, for what was real for me. And it was so shocking. So when it came to sex, I'm like, okay, well, I guess that's gone too. Like I didn't really know what norms to follow with sexuality. Um, So I became very promiscuous because it's like, well, if those rules weren't right, what are, I guess I'm just going to follow what feels good. I I guess like I want to have sex with people and they seem to want to have sex with me. So I'm just going to do that. So I had sex with quite a lot of people um, because I was sort of in, like, I mean, I didn't, I didn't really have the social conditioning from secular culture either that I wasn't supposed to do that. Um, and then eventually I was working long hours at a factory. I was like, I don't want to do that. I was searching desperately for another kind of job. And then somebody recommended that I try being a webcam girl where you strip live on camera. And I was like, I tried it and it was a little scary, but I did pretty well. And I just, there, that was the beginning of all of it. 
So when you lost your faith, did that automatically mean that you were like kicked out of your home? Like, did your parents like cut you out of their life? Like, did you just have to go out into the world and literally get a job and support yourself with no real like foundation in the secular world? Um, it wasn't quite that extreme, but to some degree, yes. So, um, I haven't been cut off from communication with my parents on their end. Um, I didn't talk to my dad for seven years cause he's a jerk. Um, but it, it's, it's weird. It's like, they'll, they'll still interact with you, but there's the norm sort of change. Like I, I've always been like a very like good person in the, in the standard sense. Like, you know, I don't lie or cheat. Like I've never stolen anything that sort of standard. Um, and my mom knew this, but after I left home at, at one point, there was some mix up with finances because I was attempting to go to college um, and failing. Um, and I had misunderstood something and like signed a document that would have like asked her to, you know, like give collateral or something for a loan. Uh, and then when she found out, she thought that I had done it intentionally on purpose. I was trying to cheat out of money. And this was completely out of character for me. I would never have done mm. anything like that. And it was really hurtful to have my mom be like, well, she told me, you know, well, well you're not a Christian now. Like, who knows what you're capable of? And it was like this, oh this relationship to me, had suddenly shifted. Like she was viewing me with like, you might fuck me over now. And that was incredibly painful. So there was not like a, an excommunication in the sense of like, we're not allowed to talk to you, but there was definitely like sort of this social excommunication where like, I am now viewed with suspicion and kind of an outsider. Um, and of course I didn't like hang out with any of other like kid friends that I used to, because they just weren't interested in being around uh, such a secular person. It's like a bad mm. influence. So, so what's your relationship like with your family now? Like, do you see them on holidays or anything like that? Or yeah, is it I, just kind of... I see my mom. Um, she's, given how conservative Christian she is, she's doing a really good job uh, in trying to be accepting of me. We don't talk about any of the the stuff <laughs> that I do. Right. right. <laughs> we don't. Uh, but she, she'll quietly, like, you know, hang out with me and then talk about things like, you know, who's where are you traveling Uh what kind, are you eating well? That sort of thing. Right. Do you think that considering like the massive amount of success that you've had and the fact that you're like financially independent and you're obviously, you know, navigating your, your way in this world really successfully, do you think that that's kind of eased some of their concerns? Because I can imagine, you know, most people have a very distinct and very biased idea of like what being in sex work is like, like, you know, back alleys and like dingy hotel rooms and stuff like that. And obviously, you know, that is not what, that is not your space. So do you think that, um, they feel like a little bit better maybe about what you're doing, seeing like how you're living your life now? I hope so. Um, it sucks because like, no matter how independent I want to feel or like how separate I try to make myself, like I still want the approval of my parents. It's like this yeah. thing is always going to be there. And so like a part of me really wants to be like, look, like I'm, I'm doing well. And I try to sort of like feed that in. Um, I try to like make them aware, uh, but there's not she, like, she can't give approval. Like I, I, I imagine that some part of her is proud of me, but she's like, isn't allowed right. to admit that to herself or something. Uh, because right. that would be like an implicit approval of sex work, which is, you know, very outside her, what her conception of not sin is. So uh, has anybody else in your community like lost their faith and reached out to you at all? Um, or are you like the only one that kind of broke free? My sisters, uh, or at least one of them, one of them is also a cam girl. The one before I, okay. I like corrupted them or something. Uh, and the youngest one is still Christian, but she tried non-sexual camming. Um, she would put on a banana suit and like do banana dances. <laughs> it was way <pretty> cute. <laughs> um, I mean, that's like perfect for TikTok. <laughs> right. I know. I keep, she's so fucking hilarious. Like I think she would kill TikTok, but uh, no, most of the people like either are pretty split. Um, either people, like a couple other people from my homeschool years, like just kind of fucked off. Um, and the rest of them are still, most of them, I'd say 90% are still really deep in it. They've, had kids who are now like kind of old because they had the kids when they were um, like 21 years old and they're married mm -hmm. and doing the pretty standard Jesus thing. Right. Right. The Jesus thing. So you ended up getting into camming and then how did you do in that world? Like how, after the initial, you know, first part, which you said was a little bit scary. Um, did you find that you enjoyed camming after that and how frequently were you doing it? Yeah. I mean, 
like you have to understand for the context at this point, my expectation for my own life was incredibly low. I had been raised to expect to be a housewife to a, like a lower class guy. Um, and then when I lost my faith, I was like, maybe the best I can get is like a couple promotions at a gas station manager type deal. Like that was like the peak of what I thought I was capable of, but like I hadn't conceived that I could do anything else uh, because like college was not an option for me due to finances. Um, so when I started camming and I made $60 the first night in a couple hours of work, I was, this was like a life-changing amount for me. I was like, holy shit, a whole new world is possible. And it was like so exciting for me that like I had like some sort of like very direct control over my ability to earn money um, that it just, I threw myself into it wholeheartedly. I was camming as much as I could. I was having an incredible time with it. I tried a bunch of creative stuff. I, this is where I learned to mime was one night there was some mime face paint flying around because it was October and I dressed up as a mime and then did a show and they loved it. So I just kept doing it. And then I eventually accidentally got like pretty good as a, a sex mime specifically, like really good at making fake dil- dicks and whatever. Um, so it was really wonderful. <laughs> that is a unique <laughs> talent. I love that. Oh my God. Um, <sighs> And I was, I wasn't making that much, maybe like 80 to a hundred dollars an hour, which I mean, for me, that was spectacular. Uh, I say not much now compared to how much I make now. (laughs) Right. Um, And I did really well after I went to Sophia Locke's cam mansion, which is a mansion that I don't know if you know Sophia Locke, but she was a cam girl doing pretty well on the website, my free cams specifically. And then she hosted a mansion where a bunch of the girls came and lived in this mansion for like a week or so and filmed a bunch of content together. And it was like a publicity stunt. So I went and with all of these other girls and really good connections. They're really fantastic. And after that, my income hit around $200 an hour on average and maintained there for about five years. Wow. So what made you decide to make the switch to OnlyFans? And was it maybe like, uh, cause I, I remember when only fans came along, I was like, Oh, I'll get my URL just cause so no one yeah. else takes it. But then I didn't take it seriously at all for years. Like I barely paid any attention to it. And then, you know, all of a sudden, like everyone was on only fans and then I decided to really try it. And that changed a lot. So that was that kind of the same thing for you. Like yeah. you got on it and you're like, this is a side thing. And then, so what made you decide to like really throw yourself into it? Yeah. Like you, I signed up early on uh, 2017 and like nobody was really using it. And I made like, I don't know, $50. And I was like, I guess that's, it's not really worth my effort. But around that time I was getting burned out of camming. Um, and so a friend offered me a data analyst position at a crypto startup. So I joined that. Um, turns out it's not great. I don't like working a normal job for other people doing things that I, I personally don't care about. Uh, and also I wasn't making a ton of money. So um, at the end, 2018, at the end of 2018, I started doing physical in-person escorting because um, I was really burned out of camming. Uh, mm-hmm. it, was, it was very fun in the beginning, but, you know, I get kind of old. You have the same clients and you have to continually produce new material, like very intensive. Um, so I was doing in-person sex work, which was really great. And I really liked it. And I did that for about a year and a half till COVID hit. And I was like, hmm, well, I don't want to kill my clients because uh, a lot of them are older. Uh, and also a lot of them just like, don't want to see me because of COVID risk. So, um, and that was right around the time OnlyFans was blowing up. So my friends were like, get on OnlyFans, decided to get on OnlyFans. And then within three months, I was making a hundred thousand dollars a month. Wow. That's amazing. So before we dive into that, because I know that you're like the resident expert on OnlyFans, um, I just want to talk about the escorting really quickly because, you know, that's something a lot of, a lot of sex workers do. A lot of people in the adult industry do performers, but a lot of people don't want to talk about it, but I f- have found that more people are being more and more open to, to talking about it. You know, it's been considered such a taboo thing for so long, but you're super open about it. So tell us a little bit about like, maybe what were your clients like in general? Yeah. Uh, well, it, clients are dependent a lot on pricing. When I first started, I charged 800 an hour and then it gradually cre- increased it to hundred, uh, sorry, 1200. And that's like, it seems like a small change in like the higher end, but even there, there was a difference in clientele versus the price. Um, So I'm not representative of the general population. I think the median in larger cities is like $500 or something an hour. Um, Mm -hmm. But for me, they tended to be uh, higher end guys, um, lawyers, doctors, uh, successful writers, uh, TV show writer people, (laughs) um, architects, uh, sort of like the kind that had the a disposable income that allowed them to see me. 
Mm-hmm. Usually, uh, average age um, of 45. I, I tracked most of the data in a spreadsheet. Um, so you you did a spreadsheet of your clients and you like did a data. I, I yeah, love how, like, I, I tracked data um, like the sex positions we had, their occupation, how attractive I found them, and how good I thought they were at sex. Who orgasmed? How many times? Um, how many times I saw them? How long the appointment was? The city it was in, stuff like that. Wow, you are a different kind of woman. That's amazing. So wait, did you reach any conclusions with all of this statistical data? <laughs> So unfortunately, I only started tracking like a, a part of the way through. So I have about 75 data points for, from 75 mm-hmm. appointments, um, which is like mm-hmm. good, but not enough to draw like very strong conclusions unless you have like a really strong correlation. Um, right. So I did find a, a weak suggestion that I tend to orgasm more with unattractive clients, which is interesting. Um and there's a lot of data, like, you know, how the frequency of sex positions. But I think that this is probably confounded by me as a person, like, depending on, like, what positions I, I sort of guided them to. So Right. Why do you think that you orgasm more with unattractive clients? Was it because they, they tried harder? Yeah, I think so. Oh, that's so <laughs> cute. Yeah. <laughs> Anytime I got a really attractive client, I was like, damn it. <laughs> All right, guys, you heard it straight from Ella's mouth. Okay. (laughs) Like you don't have to be hot to be a good lover. You've just like increased the confidence of so many guys watching this like tenfold. So thank you for that. That's awesome. Um, and then, uh, what do you think people's biggest misconception about, um, that line of work is because there's, you know, there's a lot of stigma around that. I think even more so than performing, you know, in, in media. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of stigmas and like some of it is like kind of true. Like most stereotypes are based to some degree on accuracy. Um, But I think that sort of is very grainy and misses a lot of very important nuance. Um, So for me, again, higher end. um, But like I found that the majority of the clients, I would say 80 percent seem to genuinely care about my experience and my well-being. I'd say like roughly 20 percent seem to just sort of be like I felt very interchangeable for 20 percent of them. Like I could have been mm-hmm. any other body. They just want to like slam it, be done and, and sort of leave. Uh, and they were like, obviously, mm-hmm. like, I'm paying for you. I expect to have a good experience. I'm going to sort of use you, um, which was like fine. It's, a, it's an exchange that I'm voluntarily making. And I like, prefer having that exchange than not having it. Um, but probably 80 percent of them seem to like actually really care about me. And that was really cool. And I feel like like most people sort of think about sex work is, and like the clients don't give a shit about the prostitute. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is absolutely not the case. Like men, like I didn't expect the degree that which like men really feel the need for some sort of emotional intimacy to be able to get satisfaction from the sex itself. It was really cool. That's amazing. Wow. And, and how long was your average appointment? Uh, I think like how many hours? 1.5 hours, I think was the average, maybe two. And so this kind of points to like an interesting fact about escorting. And I was talking about this with another guest recently was that you, the sex, so how long did the sex generally last? Like the sex itself? You know, I didn't track that, but like based on my memory, uh, I would say maybe 20 to 30 minutes. So that means that like, there's a good hour maybe where you guys aren't having sex. So what are you doing in that, in that time period? Talking usually. Um, yeah. Sometimes we'd go to dinner beforehand. The talk. Mm-hmm. A, a lot of guys liked it. And I also really preferred it when it was like set up like a date. Like I get to know the guy a bit beforehand. Um, mm-hmm. And then I just kind of feel like a slut, like the slut who like goes to dinner and then it's like, I don't know, I guess I'll fuck this guy. She's like, I'm a little <laughs> encouraged. <laughs> so it's pretty much just me in college, except I wasn't getting paid for it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. I, you know, I've talked to a lot of other girls who've done full service sex work and, and almost all of them had said, yeah, the majority of the time is spent talking. And a lot of these guys just want like a connection with somebody, but they don't necessarily have time for a girlfriend or mm-hmm. really the desire to have a girlfriend. They might travel a lot. And for them, it's like, you know, and it, an opportunity to experience an evening with a beautiful woman, you know, get what, you know, pretty much most guys are after when they go on a date with you. And, um, you know, no strings attached. Don't have to worry about, you know, if they have to call her the next day and if she expects a relationship or something like that. So I don't know. I've always felt that like escorting makes so much sense to me. Um, and you know, I wish more people were kind of more 
understanding and open to that line of work because I think it's I think you guys honestly provide like a service to people yeah out of the three um forms of sex work that I've done so far escorting felt to me to be the healthiest both to me and the guys that I saw it felt to be like the Mm. most humanizing and the most intimate and like I it felt like I was doing actually the most good for someone I I, it's strange to me that like escorting is so legally uh, suppressed compared to the others um because like when people are so concerned about like the adverse effects, like what is this doing psychologically to our men and women? I'm like, well, if you like, I feel like the in-person stuff is the least likely to, to cause those adverse effects. So I wish that was more legalized or decriminalized rather. Really? So that's interesting. So why do you think that? Do you think because that human connection like kind of bypasses? I don't know. Yeah. Explain to me, like, how, how do you mean by that? Yeah, it's it's more organic or something. It's uh, if I had to pull on an argument that like maybe might be used to justify other things I don't agree with, it would be um, uh, it's like the, the oldest. It's like very old. It's a uh, very traditional. We haven't. It hasn't been modified by technology. Um, like OnlyFans is something. It's like an abnormal type of experience that could only be caused in twenty twenty one ish. Um, and it's very asymmetric. You have like a lot of men viewing one woman and the men are separated from each other. Like there's no way that this could, this is like playing on psychology in like really novel ways. And we don't know the impacts of that. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. Like we have to, we have to go with tech. Uh, we have to roll with the punches, not against them. Um, but, but if we're going for like optimizing for psychological health, I would say that, uh, it seems like the older, more sustainable thing probably feels better. Yeah. All right, we are going to take a commercial break, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to talk about OnlyFans. So uh, hang tight, guys. We'll be right back. Guys, what's the first thing that women notice when they first look at you? I have a little secret for you. It's not your dick size. It's your skin. Your skin is the largest organ in your body, and it's so important that you take care of it. With Tiege Hanley, they make it so easy for you to take care of your skin without it being too complicated. There's a wash that you use every day, a scrub that you use twice a week. You have a moisturizer for the AM that includes sunscreen to protect your skin and a special intense moisturizer for the night. That's it. And look, if you forget all of this, Tiege Hanley includes instructions so you will always be on track with your skincare. The best thing about Tiege Hanley is that you can customize your own box and you can pause or cancel at any time. They ship for free within the United States and very cheap if you're outside of the United States. And because Tiege Hanley is sponsoring this episode, they're giving my listeners a great deal. Click on the link in my description box and not only will you get Tiege Hanley for the best possible price, you will also get a free gift with your first box. So click on that link and get started for just $25. Hey everyone, we are back. So Ayla, um, what are some of the main differences between camming and OnlyFans? So I know that you now are pretty much, I think, exclusively OnlyFans, right? You're not doing camming anymore. Correct. Um, I understand that monetarily you're doing much better on the OnlyFans platform. Um, but you've talked before in pre- uh, previous interviews about how there's actually like more of a um, personal connection that guys actually feel with you on OnlyFans versus camming, how, can you explain how that works? Yeah, um, well, I think there's like an interesting psychological difference. So for camming is, on my free cam specifically, you sort of broadcast live to an audience. The audience could see you um, and they all type in a chat room and this is how you interact with them. You sort of, me as a performer, like watches a chat on my screen where like guys are entering in words and all the guys sort of can talk to each other as well. Um, When people give me money as a tip, this is displayed to the entire chat. Um, and then it makes a large sound. I react to visibly to all of the other men collectively. So the kind of psychological world this creates is uh, like very hierarchical. Um, it, it is even amplified by really high earners on microcams who take like the top tippers of each month or whatever, and then rank them very publicly on their uh, profile page. So so you're, the men are entering into a very visible, very aggressive hierarchy where you climb up the hierarchy and you beat the other men by giving the woman more money. Um, and women deliberately use this. In, in my cam girl guide, I, I advise using this competition um, because like men are not just tipping to make you feel happy. They're tipping to also make you feel happy in front of all of the other men. So this is sort of like a mm-hmm. status display. Um, and the thing that this results in is that you get a sort of, you know, this sort of distribution of tippers. 
where a very small percentage of men uh, make the majority of the tips. Uh, so you, most people, most I did like a very early survey. It wasn't like a great survey, but preliminary data indicated that the majority of girls had about 80 to 90 percent of their income come from under five men, which is just absolutely insane. And um, this yeah. has pros and cons. Uh, this means that very wealthy men are attracted to this platform because they can use it to dominate all of the other men. Um, so, so this is like a certain psychological profile. Uh, OnlyFans does a completely different thing. And when OnlyFans first started up, I thought it was going to fail because it was failing to, to trigger those same points, those same psychological points that my free cams did or other campsites. Um, the OnlyFans deliberately like removes the men from each other. The men don't see each other. OnlyFans even remove the ability for them to read each other's comments. Um, girls have the ability to send mass messages that feel as though she only sent it to you. It's like the whole site is is designed um, to make the guy feel like he's the only person present on her page. And I think that this mm. is ended up being incredibly ingenious because how My Free Cams was sort of, uh, My Free Cams was encouraging very rich men to tip quite a lot, but it was invisibly suppressing all of the lower earner men from participating because why would you pay $10 to make a girl kind of like smile at you when the next guy's going to come along and just beat you? But OnlyFans provided a platform for all of these lower earning men, lower tipping men to be able to participate and feel more special. Um, and so I think that's why OnlyFans, one of the many reasons why OnlyFans is really shining right now, it, like figured out like a new psychological uh, method of extracting uh, money for very little work on the part of the woman. Yeah. Do you use the, because OnlyFans also has a live streaming function where I believe you other men can see because, you know, guys yes. can tip and then other guys can see that. Do you ever use that function on there? I have used it before. Um, I'm actually, I haven't checked recently. So it's possible there's updates that I'm not aware of. Um, but from my understanding, very few girls actually use this. Um, and it's also really buggy the last time I tried it. Maybe mm -hmm. they fixed it in the meantime, but it seemed like only because it was not putting an emphasis on uh, making the live stream a thing. Maybe that's because it doesn't really serve them for the reasons that you just explained. Like guys are there to feel like they have that one-on-one -on -one direct conversation with you when that's evidently not the case in a live stream. Yeah, I'm actually not sure. So OnlyFans goes to one extreme with the separation of men from each other and my free cams or whatever uh, is, is the other extreme with the high whales. And I'm not sure actually if, if the middle is a dip it gets possible some combination of the two would actually result with more money. Um, so I, I actually, I don't know if including the live streaming option decreases the total amount of income that OnlyFans makes. Hmm. Yeah. Um, speaking of uh, da data analyst, um, so you're obviously like an incredibly beautiful and intelligent woman. Um, but there are other beautiful and intelligent women on OnlyFans who make a fraction of what you make. I think you said your highest earning month, you made $100,000 in a month, right? Which is insane. Um, <laughs> what do you think sets you apart from everybody else? Like, what is the secret to your success? Yeah, I mean, I think the data the data thing helps. I'm, like, very oriented around, like, uh, like measuring, uh, like, funnels. And I, I think it just turns out, like, I happen to be very good at marketing. Uh, for reasons kind of unknown. Uh, like I wasn't a very good cam girl. I was like, okay, but not the top 0 0.0 whatever percent. Um, and I think it's because a lot of the thing presented is like a very live, very charismatic thing. As you can tell, like I'm a little on the, like uh, like it's kind of a spectrum type vibe. Um, uh, people call me like Vulcan or something. And so I think like the kind of body language that I have is not particularly feminine nor charming. Like people do not see me talk like this and be like, wow, I think she wants to suck my dick. Um, so I'm not very good at <laughs> live stream camming. Uh, it was, it's very abnormal for me to adopt the persona of like a very uh, flirty girl. So I think all my fans really play to my strengths in that like you don't have to do the live thing. You can take a photo, um, which you can pose very deliberately in. Um, and then you have to go to work figuring out how to get the greatest amount of eyes on your thing. Like when I work on OnlyFans, 80% of my labor goes into external OnlyFans thing. You have to continually bring in new attention. Um, so it's like figuring out new funnels to post in, figuring out like the most effective types of content to post to those funnels, like the most effective types of messaging, um, which by the way, one of the most effective uh, messaging types for me at least is something like uh, scenarios where the guy it has to inevitably have sex with the woman 
like the choice and the action is sort of taken away from both of them. And it's like, oh, oh no, like, I guess I have to have sex with you now to like continue procreation of the human race or like because we've been assigned to. Um, so stuff like that is really effective. But anyway, so it's just like tracking the kinds of messaging that seems to like result in the most conversion. Also like the kinds of like body shapes and posing that result in the greatest amount of conversion. Um, and also the kind of messaging, like people want a certain kind of message from the girl. Like I'm not just selling my body. I'm also selling a message about the kind of person that you are. If you subscribe to me, like a lot of people subscribe to me because they're like, wow, Ayla seems to be kind of smart. And I want to think of myself as somebody who masturbates to intelligent women, uh, which is great, by the way, I think that this is, we should reinforce this. And I'm glad that you'd like to masturbate to intelligent women. <laughs> I'm also feeding into this by trying to market myself as an intelligent woman to like give you this identity. Uh, <laughs> but I don't know, it's just stuff like that. I, I, I'm confused why other people don't seem to do this more, but it seems um, pretty intuitive to me. Do you think that guys prefer that because, you know, so often we're sold this idea that, you know, only stupid women get into sex work because they have no other options in life. They couldn't possibly get a job anywhere else. And, you know, they don't really understand what they're getting into. They don't see the long-term possibly negative effects and they don't have any like agency over the own, their own choices in life. And do you think that the fact that you are clearly an intelligent woman, you know, somebody who very deliberately markets herself in this world, do you think that alleviates some kind of like guilt that some guys might have about consuming porn? Oh yeah. Yeah. I think there's, there's, it's not just about the women. I think there's a stereotype that guys who consume porn are lame and they're simps and they're like submissive betas who just want to like see a girl jack up, like, masturbate herself jack off and and like can't really get a girl in real life but there's something about like if you give the girl like personality then there's some sort of like other motivation that the guy plausibly has for wanting to pursue her sexually like he can be like well i'm not just like a horny dude who just wants to get off and like can't it's like i'm horny specifically for this girl who has like a lot of uh stuff that like is hard to find in real life and so i think it creates some sort of plausible deniability um, but also, I do think it goes the other way that like um, there are those stereotypes about women, you know, having issues who get into sex work, which I think to some degree are tr is true. Like, as I've said before, multiple times in other areas, if you stigmatize something, you should probably expect to get um, people with more mental illnesses participating in that stigmatized thing. I don't think that the causation like goes directly that way, or at least not as much as we might think. Um, but it is true that that sex workers do have higher rates of mental illnesses um, I don't think that they're less intelligent. That seems unlikely. Um, but but there is something like presenting yourself as like happy and healthy and like not mentally ill uh, that seems really appealing to a lot of people. I think you're very right about that. It's interesting. So it's interesting what you're talking about, the mentally ill situation. So basically you're, you're saying that, you know, and I do know women who were interested in getting into sex work and would personally probably enjoy it and excel at it but the fear of the stigma that they would face, the pushback from their friends and their family makes them choose otherwise. And then I've also talked to other performers who have admitted to having, you know, some sort of mental illness, um, anxiety issues, what, whatnot, and talked about how sex work was so important for them because it was a place where they could control their own hours and mm -hmm. how much time and effort they put into something they um, could do a lot of things, especially now with OnlyFans, you know, in the privacy of their own home, whereas like going to a nine to five job where you're expected to be a certain kind of person and display a certain kind of personality just was something that did not work for them. Right. Exactly. Like that, that's exactly the point. I think you would see similar levels of higher mental illnesses in any job that uh, that people tend to go to if they can't work a normal job. So like probably a lot of work from home jobs, at least pre-COVID or probably disproportionately had higher rates of mental illness. Um, and there's also like stigmatized jobs, like drug dealers, for example. Like I think probably drugs should be legal, at least most of them. Um, but a lot of the people who do, who are dealing drugs probably have like other kinds of illnesses in their life. Or like for me, I, I didn't get into sex work because it was my first choice. Like I still knew that sex work was really stigmatized. It took me a long time to even feel comfortable enough to even become like an IRL prostitute because I was terrified of the stigma. Um, the only reason I did was because I was raised in bizarre circumstances and didn't really have a uh, like a good idea of what my life plan could be beyond something that I hated, which was like really hard physical labor minimum wage jobs. For me, desperate to get out, like sex work was the thing that allowed me to do so. 
And so for me, it wasn't a mental illness thing. It was just like my life is kind of uh, shit and and uh, not not wide and expansive. So this is what allows me to do well. And but for a lot of other people, mental illness is the, the limiting factor that prevents them from doing well. Um, so any any job where you're going to have like, that is available to you when you have like a lot of uh, opp oppression on your life in in any kind of way where you can't um, work normal hours is going to probably have higher rates of mental illness. Hmm. So speaking of OnlyFans, um, obviously uh, there's been a lot of talk about it in the news lately. Um, it was going to ban sex work and then it's put that on hold. So what are your feelings about all of that? And do you have any plans for if OnlyFans does end up um, eliminating sexually explicit content from their platform, which could happen as early as October? Oh, I don't know. Uh, uh, I've, I've been asked a lot about it and it's hard because no, um, nobody knows, but there's some theories about like why only fans did it. Um, probably like payment banking pressure, but like, regardless of why they did it, regardless of the true reasons, it's likely tied in some way to like the financial pressures behind the scenes. So like the banking or the payment processors, um, which have historically put a lot of pressure on sex work sites, uh, to jump through very high hoops or face punishment. Like for example, Pornhub got their payment processors revoked and now they only do crypto last I heard. Um, so yeah, that sucks. That's still the case. Wow. Yeah. Um, so it's scary. And it's like, so even if OnlyFans keeps doing porn, like there's still this, this pressure from the back end, from legal forces, from like conservative Christian groups who are putting a lot of pressure in the name of sex trafficking, um, and it's like, I don't know when that is going to stop or if it will ever stop. Uh, I'm, as for me personally, I'm going to continue using OnlyFans. It appears to be the plan until we see what happens. They said that they were going to revoke the ban. So I don't know. But if, if worse comes to worse, I'll just start fucking people IRL again. <laughs> Are you keeping like an email list in case you need to go that, that route? I mean, sales funnel. Hello. <laughs> Uh, if you guys want to know more actually about, uh, the banking discrimination and the issue with OnlyFans, I recently did a live stream podcast with journalist Gustavo Turner. We get into all that stuff. We do a really, really deep dive. Um, check it out. It is on my YouTube channel and, um, it'll give you a lot more behind the scenes information on everything that's happening with OnlyFans. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the stigma because you, you did mention that, um, you know, obviously anybody who works in sex work knows that there's a lot of stigma surrounding it. You had discussed previously that it actually doesn't affect you too badly because your father, who was, you know, a fundamentalist Christian, Christian preacher, correct? Mm -hmm. Um, was, uh, very famous in like your little community and also was received a lot of hate mail from people who didn't agree, you know, with his teaching. So, and that kind of like helped set you up to manage the stigma with sex work. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah. Yeah. My, my dad was a professional debater. He would like go around debating atheists and people who are not Christian in an attempt to show them that Christianity was more right. Um, and, um, what was I saying? <laughs> oh yeah. So he's, he's pretty pro prolific, uh, prolific rather. Uh, he has a radio show and wrote books and has a website that was very popular back in the days of the great atheist wars. Um, and so I don't know, growing up, it was, I was like very aware that like the outside world hated us was the message I constantly got. It was like, well, this inside tribe is like where you will get acceptance and, you move cities and the people in the tribe who you've never met before from a different church will show up and help you move like that, that sort of thing. Or we all, we give you discounts in community for getting your car fixed or whatever. So it's like inside, it's like very insular and very protective and supportive. And outside is like the angry world who hates you, doesn't get you. They're the secular people who will judge you. Um, but you know, really we have the truth. And so I had this constant feeling of being like we were persecuted, but this was good and safe. So I think this sort of exposed me to like a lot of like the concept of a lot of external hate um, while giving me like sort of like a safe um, stance to take, sort of knowing that this was OK. And I think this sort of like de-triggered me or something or desensitized me to that concept. Um, there's a kind of ironic uh, result from my dad's work. Thank you, dad, I guess. 
Um, but I grew up seeing him get a lot of hate mail. He got death threats. Like the FBI was involved. He's been swatted before. Like people really hated my family. Um, so I'm just, I'm used to being like the subject of hate, even if it was sort of like blown, overblown because we like to overblow how much hate we were getting as Christians. Um, but now when people like yell at me or telling me I'm stupid, I'm like, this is <laughs> exactly what the world is. This falls very in line to the kind of world I was raised in. It's just the kind of people yelling at me are now the kinds of people who I thought would once protect me. So it's very switched. Mm, yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah. The, I mean, there's a lot of correlation there between working in the sex work world. I mean, the sex work world's pretty insular. We support each other and we face a lot of stigma from people on the outside who don't, you know, understand yeah. what we do. Uh, you've also talked about how your brain kind of works differently and you're very good at like compartmentalizing things. Mm -hmm. So how does that help you in your career? Yeah, I, I think this is, uh, it's affected me in a few ways. So with, with in-person sex work, I have a friend who does it and it's hard for her to compartmentalize. Like some part of her, I think like feels really personally affected by like the fact she chose to have sex with this man. Um, it's like not totally um, like weighted out by the fact that she received money from it. And, and it, it's hard for her to deal with. I don't think I have this thing for me. It's like I the the container of the dude that I have sex with is like just that container. And it is only that container. And I get to be as genuine as I can manage in that container and as caring and as loving. Like I've often had had sex with the people that I saw who paid me. And I had the thought like, wow, I think I love this person. Um, sort of in that container. And then you leave the container and then you're sort of your brain shifts, it's sort of like getting on stage to perform a play. It's like you sort of become this character. Um, mm. And and I enjoy like feel letting that character be as real as I possibly can. And in, in a way it is real. Like I don't think I'm faking. Um, but this is definitely a compartmentalization thing I have. I also have it online. Uh, like I know a lot of people masturbate to me and this is fine and kind of nice sometimes, but occasionally people who I don't like masturbate to me and I have to sort of like emotionally disconnect from that because it's like, I have this urge to sort of hide <laughs> or people in my real life who, who uh, I know like might masturbate to me and a part of me is like, Oh God, this is creating a weird social context where like, I'm not sure how to handle this sexual tension that I didn't necessarily consent to. Um, but whatever. It's like, I typically just check, like, is this going to have an actual practical impact on me? Like, what actually do I have to fear from this? It's like keeping really close in touch with the concept of like, what are the practical things that are going to happen to my physical body that aren't like just mental stories that I'm creating. And then like, just knowing that it, it really releases a lot. It makes me feel like really able to, to switch characters, to compartmentalize and sort of to disconnect from the things that might otherwise cause me a lot of grief. Do, do you find that that helps you with dating? Um, and how is your relationships different? Because you also have mentioned before that you're polyamorous. So how does that work for you? And are you ever like, you know, I know that some people are kind of polyamorous, but emotionally monogamous. Mm -hmm. Describe how that works for you in your life. Yeah, I'm super poly. Um, have been full-blown, 100%, no doubt poly since the moment I heard what it was. I was like, oh, that's what I've been this whole time. Um, it is uh, like an orientation for me uh, for almost for 10 years now. It's been a decade. Um, and yeah, for the sex work specifically, it's, it's pretty easy to compartmentalize. I dated a guy once with, who, who was dating when I started escorting and he was a little uncomfortable about it at first. He's like, well, Ayla's going out and fucking all these guys. And then he said like it took like a month or two before like watching me come back. He's, and he said he realized like, oh, this is like severely compartmentalized for her like the kind of sex that I have with her is like totally different than the kind of sex she's having with other people like this is not this is not the same playing field really um mm -hmm. and so I think once you realize that he felt a lot better and I think this is really true like the kind of thing I do for work is incredibly separate from the kind of thing that I do in my personal life um in regards to like how it fits in my brain like the character of who does it uh and I'm sure this is true for a lot of other women who do sex work and also have sustainable relationships is your dating life difficult because of what you do? Do you, do you meet guys that you really like and then they discover you're a sex worker and that's the end of it? <laughs> no, I would say my dating life is easier because of what I do. Uh, Interesting. Because like if I wouldn't want to date a guy who is uncomfortable with sex work, like that, that's an indication of a lot of other things like sexual jealousy or some sort of um, like approach to the concept of like public sex that, that just I, is not really compatible with. Um, and it's fine if other people like that, but it's, I don't. And so it's like a really good, easy, fast filter. So the guys who are fine with my sex work, and I'm extremely open about it, you know, this is the name that I use, the face that I use, like uh, it's hard to avoid. 
Uh, as one of the first things I say when people ask what I do, I'm like, yes, I'm a sex worker. I do OnlyFans. Um, so yeah, if guys are down with it, then it's very likely that they're going to be the kind of person I'm more interested in dating. And it's, so they just sort of self filter. It's, it's much better for my dating life. I haven't had any yeah. trouble finding anybody really. Uh, I did a dating survey recently where I put a bunch of things that I liked and then I scored each question and then I had a bunch of men take it. And then I took the, I, I met up with the top scores and now I'm dating one of them and it's really good. You're like my favorite person ever. I mean, you use data analysis to like find yourself a boyfriend. That's so fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> there needs to be more people like you. It's really good. I this recommend kind of reminds- it to everybody, honestly, if you have enough <laughs> <a> platform. <laughs> Maybe you should start your own like sex worker dating site where you can use data analysis to, you know, help sex workers find. Well, Cause I understand that you've also been, thanks. I'll take 10%. Um, you've, you've been kicked off of like, uh, okay. Cupid was it? You've been kicked off of dating sites. And yeah. I know a lot of other sex workers have as well. Yeah, it sucked. I was the, the biggest OkCupid stan. I've been on OkCupid for over 10 years, since I was 17 years old. I participated in the forums. I was a mod. I know I've answered thousands of questions on OkCupid. I had met and dated a billion people. I was like, oh, OkCupid's great. And then one day I wake up and they've just banned my profile because like, I'm I'm open about being a sex worker in the place. It's like, what do you do? I'm like, well, I'm a sex worker. I'm not going to hide it. Um, right. Banned. So fuck OkCupid. Fuck them. I think also, though... Um, your approach, as scary as it may seem for some girls, I think it's probably the best one because I know a lot of girls who will meet a guy that they like, they won't tell them that they're a sex worker. They'll yeah. wait till the guy gets to know them because their hope is that, oh, he'll get to know me. He'll like me as a person. And then he'll accept that I'm a sex worker and it won't bother him. But you like kind of right off the bat, um, eliminate anybody who might have an issue with what you do. Cause you're just open about it. And your argument is, well, if they have a problem with me being a sex worker, it's not somebody I want to date anyways, which I think is kind of backwards from what a lot of people do. Right. Yeah. I think a lot of people enter under the assumption that they won't be able to find a mate if they're a sex worker. And in some communities, this is true. I think probably in some communities, trying to be quiet about it is like probably a better mate finding tactic. Um, if the alternative is you find no one and you aren't okay with that alternative. Um and probably more conservative communities. Luckily in my communities, they're very sexually open. Like most of my friends are polyamorous. Like a lot of them are sex workers. So it's like extremely normalized. Like I say, I'm a sex worker and nobody black, nobody blinks an eye. Um, so it's not like, I'm not like really sacrificing a lot and it doesn't feel like I'm culturally sacrificing a lot. Like people don't hear I'm a sex worker and be like, wow, her mate value must be lower. Um, so I, I'm, I, I think that it probably is a viable strategy in other types of communities. Like my advice for people who are doing that right now is like, just get yourself into a more sexually open community. And then you might start organically feeling like it is actually safe to openly come out as a sex worker. And like, that is not going to make you be alone forever. Like you still are going to have other options if that person is not okay with it. Yeah. I was just going to say like, find yourself a different community Yeah, because they are out there. I mean, there's so many sex workers out there and, you know, we find each other and we bond together. Um, because yeah, I mean like living your life where you feel like you have to hide what you do for a living is not fun. Right. Not fun at all. Um, you know, talking about all the stigma and the dating and the, will you find a man? It it kind of reminds me of one particular interview that you did with a, with a host who, was really trying to poke holes in your arguments where you were, you know, defending your choice to be a sex worker. And one of the things he brought up is like, well, what happens 10 years from now? And like, you can't find anybody. And like, aren't you going to regret it? And are you setting an example, a bad example for other women who might do the same thing? And then, you know, God forbid, they'll never, a man will never love you, you know? And that's something that you hear so often, like a man will never love you if you're a sex worker. Um, you've gotten so much, you know, mainstream attention since the OnlyFans thing. I know you've done a lot of interviews, a lot of podcasts. Do you find yourself like challenged on your career choice often? Like, do you, are you constantly having to defend being a sex worker and does it ever get like tiresome for you? You feel like you probably answer the same questions over and over again. I actually wish I were challenged more. Um, I, I'm challenged a little bit, mostly on Twitter when people are like, you're a whore. And I'm like, are you making a joke? And they're like, no, you're a whore. I'm like, well, yes, I am a whore. Thank you for telling me. Like that sort of interaction. Um, I, it's very rare that I'm like actually challenged about my sex work uh, in public spheres. I think typically because the kind of people who want to challenge sex workers uh, don't go talk to them. 
Um, so when I am being challenged, I actually like it because it means that they are talking to a sex worker about the doubts that they have. And I think we need more of that. Like, I would love to be in more uh, interviews with people who like, are really anti-sex work. Because like half the job is humanizing yourself, right? Like, like I'm a person who has like opinions and a life and feelings, and like I'm here talking to you as another human being, and and like that's half the battle. It's just like sort of like do that empathy connection. Um, so yeah, I, I think we need more of that that conversation, and I would I wish I could do it more. Yeah, that's great. I mean, most people are afraid to take on those those kinds of debates because confrontation is scary. And, you know, yeah, some people are really adamant, adamant. I mean, the place that I find, uh, you know, our line of work challenge the most is actually <laughs> in YouTube comments, ironically. <laughs> oh, no. There's going to be someone who's going to watch this on YouTube and be like, you're all whores. <laughs> Still? Like, they don't know what they're getting into? You know, th this is actually one of the wonderful things that I love about YouTube is the algorithm. So the algorithm will... Um, recommend your videos to, as opposed to, it's like the opposite of Instagram. We get like shadow banned. Right. And they yeah. like, don't let people who follow you even see you, but like YouTube will push my videos to like fucking everybody if it does well. And if somebody watches it, you know, if we get a lot of views on it, it'll push it to people. And I'll actually often get comments of like, how did this end up in my recommendations? I hate porn. I'm like, well, all I got to say is that YouTube is owned by Google. So maybe check your Google searches. <laughs> on. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's really good. <laughs> um, can you also discuss the difference? Cause you, there was another, um, podcast that you did where you had a really intelligent discussion about performative sexuality and actually being a sexual performer. Um, I hope I'm, I'm saying that correctly. Uh, can you describe the difference between the two and how society views them differently? Um, I'm trying to remember the one you're referring to. Is it where I was talking about um, how uh, like lots of people do sexual signaling without actually being sexual? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think, I think we're seeing like an increase in sexual signaling and a lot of people are interpreting this as sexuality. I think there's like a conflation of those two things. So like, for example, like popular music videos where people shake their big booties and then talk about how they're going to like suck your dick dry. Um, these things I would consider to be performative sexuality, like the people who are singing these tend to be mostly monogamous or tend to have had very few sexual partners, or, or at least, well, this is what they claim. Um, and so there's this thing of like, like really pumping up the kind of sexual power that they have, like sort of a display, like peacock feathering in, in a way. Um, but there's not actually that much sluttiness going on. I think what American young youngins are having less sex than they've ever had before. I'm quoting this statistic without actually looking it up. So maybe I am repeating false information, but that is what the internet has been saying lately. Um, and so it's like, I don't, I don't understand, like there's, there's obviously like a disconnect happening here. And then people like really worry. They're like, well, if you're doing this performative sexuality, like we believe that this is translating to like actual promiscuity, like the degradation of the family and stuff like that. But it doesn't appear to be the case. Um, is that the differentiation that you were thinking about? Or the yeah. Thing? Yeah, I think so. It, it was just, you were just talking about, you know, exactly the people that, you know, these, these sexy commercials that we see of, I don't know, was it Kim Kardashian or something like eating a Big Mac and, you know, all, all of that is like very acceptable and very sexy and, and all these suggestions that, that these, these pieces of media um, make. But then when you actually do actual sexual performances on video, um, how that's like, an absolute no, no. So like the suggestions, okay, but the actual act of it is considered bad. And yeah. that's just like, it's always yeah, It's because they're like giving up power in some way, right? Like the performative sexuality thing, like is performative and people are very worried about it. Um, but like the actual thing, the actual like, like pedal to the mm -hmm. metal, if you will, um, <laughs> uh, like people are, are very not okay with that, which I mean, makes sense. Yeah. So you were saying something, you were saying that like in that way that kind of people might view that as you giving up power because mm -hmm. you're, because you're creating this power dynamic by suggesting what you might give to someone. But when you actually give it away, then you've lost that power because you're no longer withholding that promise. Right. Right. Yeah. You're giving That's it to everybody who sees it kind of, which is like partially right. why you're considered to have decreased mate value. Is because like if you mate with everybody, with every man, you know, even if it's like internet mating by people watching you mate, um, then 
then people will consider you to like no longer be like a worthwhile partner. You know, what's interesting is that I, I noticed that you kind of use that dynamic in on your OnlyFans um, because you you've talked about how, you know, when you send out locked DMs of you actually doing like a boy girl scene, which I believe you don't do like incredibly often, like you're not releasing that like every week or anything like that. You know, some girls are releasing content like that weekly. And when you, when you send that out, you, you price it very high and you also unsend it after what, like 50 purchases or something like that. So it keeps it really, really exclusive. Right. Um, and you said something along the lines of like, you know, I don't really necessarily want that many people to see my stuff. And it's very much like reserved for a select group of people. So like, obviously that's worked really well for you. Um, do you find that it's the same guys waiting for you to release that, that content? Because you have to do, you, and do you release it at the same time? Like do people in Germany have to get up at three o'clock in the morning to buy yeah. your video? <laughs> yeah, it's it's quite exclusive. I mean, this is partially a marketing thing, or maybe entirely a marketing thing. Um, it's because like you want to like create a feeling of exclusivity by being actually exclusive. Like a very small percentage of people are like going to be good enough to actually see the thing. The people who are the most dedicated, uh, who are like willing to sacrifice the most and be to be part of this very small elite group who gets to see, you know me, Ayla, or whatever. And and this is more effective when I like I raise my own status. Like if I am well known, uh, then it's more uh, meaningful for people to be part of an, an elite group that has seen something very intimate of somebody well known. So it really feeds into itself. Um, but yeah, I, I market my boy girl videos very carefully, um, especially because like boy girl sort of removes the illusion of intimacy with the dude. Because uh, like OnlyFans, right, like separates men from each other. This concept that you and the guy and the woman are like, sort of having this special bond. And then to see her having sex with another guy tends to kill it. I've known girls who are camming who said they've lost whales when they released their first boy girl video because they realized like, oh, oh, she actually has some some other man in her life. And that's very threatening. Right. Do you ever run into stalker situations where men feel like they really do have this like Uber connection with you, that you're their online girlfriend, that you're not dating other people and have taken that to an extreme? Oh, yeah. I've gotten a couple stalkers who are mentally deranged and convinced that I'm in a relationship with them and stuff. The erotomanic kind, which really sucks because like it sort of removes your feeling of control. Like normally you have the sense like, well, if I tried to communicate with this person and told them to fuck off, like they would sort of respond to it. Or if, you know, I gave threats, they might respond to it. But the people who are mentally deranged are really terrifying because it's like, wow, there's like absolutely no human way possible I could communicate with this person, and actually get them to fuck off. Uh, so it's really terrifying. I've had to take a lot of precautions to protect my safety. Yeah, that can be that can be really scary. I remember specifically. So Aria Giovanni was a very popular kind of pit up nude model back in like the early two thousands, and she was one of my best friends. And you know, guys were obsessed with her. And she, we were at a convention once, and I remember this guy came up, handed me his phone, and was like, "Can you take?" A photo of us. And I was like, okay, sure. And he gets down on one knee and opens a box and proposes to her with this whole backstory that he built in his mind that they went to camp together when they were kids and they've had this long lasting relationship. And he wanted to, you know, do this open proposal in front of everybody to solidify their relationship. And he handed me the phone to take a picture of, you know, like when normal people do a proposal and you have like a stranger take a photo. Um, that was the closest I've ever gotten to that kind of That's like terrifying. obsession. And it was really scary. Yeah. That's yeah. really terrifying. Yeah. There's something just do you ever have about it. Right. Do you, uh, so how do you screen clients then if you do, or do you do in real life, um, escorting anymore? Now um, that you're like doing so well in OnlyFans? I, I am down to do it. My rates are high and I haven't been marketing it uh, because OnlyFans mm. bans you if you're, if you do in person. Right. You can't even put the word meat on there. Right. And so even if I yeah. advertise it only on my other social media, I'm still at risk for being banned and I don't want to risk my IRL thing, but I'm not opposed to doing IRL things for a lot of money. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so I haven't had to do a lot of screening since like my visibility really raised in the last year or two. Um, and so mm -hmm. I haven't returned to an IRL sort of escorting situation where I need to do screening. And I'm a little concerned about that. 
Um, but yeah. there, there's ways to do it that I can, like, you can always do like a video interview with the guy beforehand if you need to, Yeah, that sort of thing. And, and do you ever do, um, cause I've had, I had, um, another escort on Amy Taylor, who's amazing. By the way, if you haven't watched my interview with her, it's, it's I haven't. great. Actually, you two would, you two would really like each other. She's so smart. Um, cool. and she's been an escort for years. Um, just really intelligent. Is that her escort? And she, uh, yes. Cool. Yeah. She's really, she's one of my favorite guests. Um, but she talks about screening and I think, uh, if it's, she's at a stage now where she doesn't take on new clients. She has a few that pay, I think pretty high rates. Actually, I think she only has one client now, wow. only one person that she sees. Um, and he pays enough for her to sustain her lifestyle and she doesn't need to see other people. Um, but, uh, Incredible. yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. And, and, but she talked about how she screened people and she would do a video chat. And then I think she would meet them in a public place first for like coffee or something before she would ever like take on an actual booking. Um, she had a whole system of doing it. That's but, really smart. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Ella, thank you so much. Yeah. Ella, Ella, I fucking knew it. I have it like written here. I'm like, this is how you pronounce it. Don't fuck it up. And I just fucked it up. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Your questions are really good. And you obviously have done quite a bit of research. I'm impressed. Well, it's been, um, it's been really, lo it's been lovely to research you because it's been really interesting. Um, all of your conversations are really interesting. I've learned, you know, you have like all of these strategical, um, pieces of advice for OnlyFans, which is great. You know, like to learn a little bit and, um, you know, you're just a smart woman. So it's entertaining to, to listen to you. So thank you. Well, again, thank you so much for coming on. This has been fantastic. Um, can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media, please? Yeah. A couple of places. My website is knowingless.com. It's K N O W knowingless.com. And uh, my Twitter is Ayla Girl, A E L L A underscore girl. If you do not include the underscore, you will get my porn. Um, and between those two things, you can find all of the other things. Perfect. And then you can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. I also just started posting on TikTok. Again, I gave up, but I'm, I've, I'm coming back. So follow me there, um, Holly Randall Unfiltered. And of course, if you want to support this podcast, Go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered, where I give you all kinds of bonus content in exchange for you supporting my show. And in fact, myself and Ayla are actually about to do like a bonus Q&A, which you can only see if you join my Patreon. So give it a look. And thank you guys so much for joining us. And I'll see you next week. Bye.